any beach show is the ultimate destination, showcasing how tech is transforming the future of content creation. Experience a world of opportunity to benefit your craft, your career, and your business. Register today at nabshow.com. Use code BA11 to get a free exhibits pass. Legends tell of ships that sailed too close to it, only to drop off the edge of the world, never to be seen again. But those sailors who turned back told tales of a great waterfall and dragons guarding the entrance to a hidden world. Wow. Not just a nest hiccup, but a line from which all dragons come. DreamWorks Animation's How to Train Your Dragon trilogy has come to an emotional conclusion, and to discuss the making of the new film, How to Train Your Dragon, The Hidden World, we'll be joined today by writer-director Dean Dubois. I'm Carolyn Giardino. Welcome to The Hollywood Reporter's Behind the Screen. The first How to Train Your Dragon film, which opened on March 26, 2010, was written and directed by Dean Dubois and Chris Sanders, based on the book series by Cressida Cowell. The pair previously wrote and directed Disney's Lilo and Stitch. How to Train Your Dragon follows Hiccup, voiced by Jay Baruchel, whose father is the leader of his Viking village of Burke. In the first film, Hiccup meets Toothless, a night fury dragon, and their unbreakable friendship continues to develop in the 2014 sequel, where we see Hiccup become the leader of Burke. Both of these films earned Academy Award nominations for Best Animated Feature, and composer John Powell was Oscar nominated for the score for the first film. Hiccup's journey comes to a beautiful and moving conclusion in The Hidden World, which opened in theaters on February 22nd. Dean, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. So for those who haven't yet seen the film, this picks up in Burke, and the dragons and the humans are living peacefully together. Why don't you take it from there? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a year after the events of How to Train Your Dragon 2. So Toothless is now the alpha dragon of the entire dragon flock, which is ever increasing, because Hiccup, now the young chief, he's taken over for his late father, Stoic. Though a rookie, he has been very ambitiously trying to create this dragon Viking utopia that he always dreamed of. And it has come to fruition, but it's you know teetering on collapse. There's just, there too are too many, many dragons <laughs> and too little space. It's sort of unruly and out of control, but he loves it. And the people love it too. It's just, now they're squarely in the sights of their enemies. They know exactly where they are. They know the largest flock is always circling around Burke. And it's put pressure on Hiccup to really consider the future. So along with that, you know, along with considering this old mariner's myth about a hidden world at the very edge of our known earth where dragons originate from, some ancestral home that his father told him about when he was just a young boy. And that flashback was very sweet. Yeah, it's, it's so nice to have Stoic back in the movie for just kind of this warm hug from the past. But in combination with that, their enemies, the surviving warlords of this world army, have employed a specialist, the man known for having eradicated all of the Night Furies, or so he thought, and his name is Grimmel the Grizzly. I know this handiwork. Grimmel the Grizzly, famous back where I'm from, the smartest dragon hunter I ever met. Well, he can't be that smart. He left his trap unmanned. <laughs> Nothing's accidental when it comes to old Grimmel. He lives for the hunt, to get inside the mind of his prey, to control its every choice. It's all a game to him. Grimmel is voiced by F. Murray Abraham, and he is our villain in this one. He is, and F. Murray Abraham is a spectacular actor who brought so many levels of, of complexity and subtlety and just powerhouse acting to this role. But yes, he learns of a surviving Night Fury, Toothless, who is the head of the flock, the Alpha. But more interesting to him is actually this notion that the young chief of Stoic is now promoting peace with dragons, peaceful living. And he finds that to be a very insidious idea that he's determined to crush. He's an elitist of the mindset that dragons don't deserve to breathe the same air as we humans do. And so this idea of sort of spreading the word that dragons aren't as bad as we think they are is of particular interest to him. So it sets our heroes out on a quest after a, a clash with Grimmel and Toothless's introduction to the bait that he used, a very rare and elusive subspecies of Night Fury is called the Light Fury, Hiccup realizes that they have to take everything they have, all of their dragons, all of their people, and what they can carry, and go for broke in search of this mythical land. Because if it proves to be true, it might be a way of just disappearing off the map permanently and living with dragons and keeping their peaceful way of life. 
There are some really sweet moments in this film that you pay homage to the original, and one of them is when Toothless and this light fury, who is his love interest in this film, start to get acquainted. Tell us about creating that scene and how you made sure that it was very reminiscent of the scene in the first film when Toothless and Hiccup meet. Well, you touched upon it for sure. Like We wanted to create a bookend. Knowing that this was a trilogy, it had to have elements that connected to the first and the middle installment. But in this case, we wanted a bookend scene also on a beach, also isolated, a bit of a dance. But this time it's between Toothless, who is the last of his kind, who has no siblings or parents to have taught him the ways of dragons and has been domesticated living with hiccups. So he's corrupted <laughs> and he's suddenly this bumbling amateur, despite his dignity as the alpha dragon with the light fury who is, you know, she is of the hidden world. She is pure and her only interactions with humans have been very negative. So she's the experienced one on the beach and it's this uh, kind of Cyrano de Bergerac homage with a beautiful piece of music by John Powell and just the power of masterful animation and in, in pantomime. Over the three films, how has the animation evolved? Well, it's certainly become a lot better in terms of its fidelity and what we can put on screen. The tool set has improved. And if you look at the first film as compared to the third film, just visually, it's a lot richer. But I think the biggest difference is just we have a team of animators that have largely been working together and working on their specific characters for a decade. So like any actor playing a role, you get to expand your knowledge of nuances and capability. So the models themselves have improved in terms of controls. They've become more complex. In fact, we rebuilt all of our characters for this third film. And combined with this sort of masterful understanding of who that character is and the evolution that the character has undergone, it just allowed us to put much more subtlety, I think, in the performance up on screen. They're so expressive. And if you'll notice, even in a, in a scene where two characters are talking, say Hiccup and Aster talking on the cliff, we were finally able to deliver a world that feels alive. We've got out of focus branches and, and leaves that are rustling in the background, of waist high grass that's shifting around them, subtle breezes that would lift a lock of hair and set it down again. And it just adds so much more life to what is essentially a talking heads scene. So I think it's the combination of everybody working with the very latest advancements of the technology and also just bringing this very true sort of authentic understanding of the characters to the screen. Now, you also worked with extraordinary cinematographer Roger Deakins on these films. What did you talk about for this last film? Yes, we were very happy that Roger was willing and able to join us on the last installment. And I think that he has also had the experience of watching the technology grow up. Yeah, I think he was a little frustrated in the beginning to realize that he couldn't just make a request and have an artist shift it in the moment and have it render immediately. Sometimes they had to wait days before they could see an image. So now it has reached a point where he can sit down with a lighting artist, for example, talk about a lighting concept place lights and get something back almost immediately and then make shifts and balance it out. So it's, it's much more of a live interactive feel. But as with all three of the films, Roger was off shooting other projects as well. We would send him images, we'd send him storyboards and he would reply back with some feedback that we'd incorporate. And when he was here in LA, he would spend entire days with us. It's always a masterclass. And what I love most about Roger is he's such a soft-spoken gentleman, but he has so much truth and experience on offer. And he would come in and look at some really dynamic shot that we might have set up that we were all very proud of. And he would say, but why? Whose point of view is it? How are you advancing the story through your character's eyes? And uh, <laughs> we'd, we'd all hang our heads in shame a little bit and realize <laughs> that we were just showing off. But it, he's always a great reminder of the true essence of this art form. And I love that about him. 
and just general great enthusiasm as well. I think he pushed certainly POV, Pierre-Olivier Vincent and Dave Walver, our visual effects supervisor, to, to land very iconic, definitive looks for every sequence of the film. Um, so he's had a, a continued invaluable contribution to the way these films look and how they're received, because they do seem to exist somewhere between the world of animation and live action. They straddle that line a bit. And then The Hidden World is absolutely stunning. Tell us a little bit about the production design and what went into this. I think you used some new software for that as well, didn't you? Yes, we did. It started with a dream. I had a dream about a hole in the sea. And when we were talking about The Hidden World, I mentioned that to our production designer, Pierre-Olivier Vincent. And we discussed it could be an undersea volcano that rises from the seabed to the surface, like an atoll with water pouring in, like a 360-degree Niagara Falls, only a mile wide. It would have been the sorry fate of any sailor getting too close. They would have been dragged over the edge. But on the back of a dragon, should you plummet into it, it would open up into these networks of tunnels and chambers. And we thought more than a cave, because we've seen caves in both films, this would be a world. If this was the ancestral home of dragons, if we were in fact going to say goodbye to dragons at the end of the movie, we should give them a place that felt more like a return instead of a banishment. So we tried to populate it with as many earthly things that feel magical. So phosphorescence and bioluminescence, the idea of giant crystal shafts that might be channeling light from deep magma. We thought about the idea that all of this water pouring in would interact with live magma and create all of this steam and it would be this salty, wet atmosphere that might encourage coral to actually grow on some of these stalactites and stalagmites and in midair. And so just those discussions kind of brought up lots of ideas and, and we began to explore that and push it as far as we could without abandoning our rather fanciful understanding of geology and biology of this planet. We just didn't want it to feel suddenly alien. And tell us a little bit about the software that was developed for it. Sure. Well, The Hidden World was probably the greatest test of our new back-end software. So we upgraded to a ray tracer, and that in itself is not particularly special because a lot of studios have them. But I think in combination with our front-end tools that were developed during the second movie, it suddenly allowed us to put all of that scope and scale up on screen in the finest of detail. Whereas before, we might have to have simplified the vision of it and made much of this environment matte paintings. Here, we could actually build it completely in geometry. We could put the camera anywhere we wanted to. We could explore it fully. And the Which scope... Which is so beautiful for the flying scenes. Yes, yes. And actually, I think when you're on the back of a dragon, you really do start to get this sense of the dimensionality of it. And the fact that the light sources were coming from rather unusual sources for us, that we were able to you know, calculate light in a very sort of complex and nuanced way within that space. So it definitely felt like you were transported into something that that was otherworldly and wonderful. And it was all brought together with this realization that, wow, we can create any shot we want to here because we're no longer restricted to a single flight path due to the fact we only built that one section. Suddenly this, this entire space was alive. And I hope it gets to be used more. You know, my dream is that there would be some sort of theme park attraction where you could fly <laughs> yeah. around in the hidden world because it re- there was so much left to explore that we just didn't have the screen time to really get into. Is there talk for virtual reality projects or theme parks like you mentioned? I hope so. I hope so. I, not, not that I'm aware of at the moment, but hopefully the film is a success and they'll want to sort of continue that experience in some sort of palpable, visceral way. Let's talk about character development a little bit. One of your new characters, Grimmel, the villain. Yeah, uh, so Grimmel, we definitely wanted to have a contrast to Drago Bloodfist in the second film. So Drago was just this mountain of a man. He was a, a brute. You know, everything that he did was with physical force and intimidation. And it seemed more interesting to us that this would be a man who has been a loner for his life. He's a very skilled hunter, sort of lean and spry weathered to some degree, but with great experience. And he has this inherent lack of empathy for all living things, human and dragon alike. And so this this could be a character that would have a certain amount of charm and wit and self-confidence. He would enjoy playing with his prey, like a cat with a mouse. And that to us felt like a natural nemesis to Hiccup, who is now growing in confidence, but still very, very much rooted in his ideology of 
of inclusion and peaceful coexistence. Here comes a guy who wants to snuff that out completely. And he enjoys the hunt. You know, he's missed it. He's a guy who's sort of earned a reputation by being the best at what he does and the great notoriety of having wiped out one of the most feared dragons in the world. And this is sort of a second chance. It's almost him coming out of retirement to enjoy one last hunt. His character is trying to change the inclusive nature of Burke that Hiccup brought together. That message, to what extent were you trying to say something else? Oh, yeah, you, you see it reflected in the world, for sure. There, there are people who are so rooted in their beliefs that they're unwilling to accept another side to it. And that's what Hiccup's been about from the very beginning. His father was that way. His community was that way. And so it was Hiccup taking a chance on a known enemy and coming to see another side of this conflict and seeing himself in Toothless. That's really what changed minds. So he's an example of a character who is not going to be dissuaded from his stance. And it comes with sort of an elitist belief and a blanket declaration that dragons are nothing more than murderous thieves and that's it. So he, he's closed off and he would rather kind of snuff out what he thinks is an insidious progressive idea than to change his own ways. How much of your personality is in Hiccup? <laughs> I think that Hiccup is, yeah, he's certainly a combination of traits that I share with Jay Baruchel. Jay and I grew up about an hour and a half away from one another. We both grew up without money, we had, you know, fairly small towns. And I think that we channel a lot of his overcompensation, you know, for any sort of lack of, you know, physical heft. He's sort of kind of gangly and awkward, but he's super smart and very quick-witted. And that's something we found in the character. It's always fun to have a character who is determined to assimilate, to live up to everyone's expectations, but ill-equipped to succeed. It just makes for a character that I think the audience is rooting for. It's like, look in the mirror, you're all right. Everything you're embarrassed about could actually, you know, change your world instead of you always trying to change yourself to fit in. But I think Hiccup is a, he's, he's definitely a character who has a lot to be ashamed of and to hide in his own perception. And you know, I, I grew up just like that. I wasn't sporty. I was kind of a little bit reclusive with my comic books in my room. I was gay, you know, and that was going to not go over well in my, my small town with my friends and my family. It just, it was always something that I was very ashamed of. And I knew that the day was coming when it would be somehow exposed. And I felt like I was always preparing in other ways to be successful, to be good at something, to help compensate for the disappointment. And I think that finds its way into Hiccup as well. You know, he's just a character who ultimately knows he's never going to live up to Viking expectations and certainly his father's. Yeah, he's inadequate in a lot of ways. So you mentioned John Powell. So he returns as the composer and he was Oscar nominated for the music in the first film. How did the two of you approach the score for this film? John Powell is, for me, the great collaborator in all of this. I believe wholeheartedly that music is half of the equation, and it does the heavy lifting, where dialogue cannot really achieve the same emotional result. We can always rely upon music to kind of transcend words and go right to the heart. There's great power in that, and there's also great power in knowing that John is not only a composer, but a storyteller in his own right. So I involve him early. I, I have him read a script and react to it. I want the ideas to sort of have time to gestate with him. And John's the type of composer where he thrives on the pressure of a deadline. So he tends not to want to get involved until, in terms of actual writing music, until as late as possible. Because he just, you know, that, that sort of burning the midnight oil energy is what really brings him to his creative place, which I totally respect and I understand as a procrastinator, <laughs> a lifelong procrastinator. But it's amazing to watch. And I've also come to realize that, you know, we went through the traditional score spotting where we sat down with John and went through scene by scene and talked about the intent. But it's almost unnecessary because he already understands what we're going for. And his process is to watch the movie without any temp soundtrack at all, which is cringeworthy to me. But he, you know, I, I would imagine that the cues are springing forth in his own mind when he's watching it. And then I just encourage him to do his thing and be a cheerleader from the sidelines and watch as it evolves. He has such an innate story sense. He goes for harmonies to themes that I'm trying to push on the surface. 
and it deepens the story. He often will go the opposite route of what I first imagined. He might, in an action scene, go for something heartbreaking, because that's where the, the, the true emotional current is. So it continues to be an education for me. But I did say, this is your last chance. So anything that you really wanted to put out there and have it be part of this trilogy, go for it. You know, I fully, I fully support it and embrace it. And he just, you know, once again, overwhelmed me with his results. It's, it's amazing. He, he tops himself every time. Now that advice you gave him, I'm sure you gave it to yourself as well. So what were the things that you still wanted to put in this trilogy? <laughs> well, certainly the ending. The ending, as it turns out, is having the effect that we all hoped it would. Because I am a person who has loved bittersweet endings as far back as I can remember stories and movies. And certainly stories where you have disparate characters that are brought together by some extraordinary circumstance. And they have such a profound impact on one another that even though they may separate in whatever means, it could be death, it could be you know, parting ways, they will never be the same again as individuals. They're completely transformed from the characters that began the story. And that always sticks with me, whether it's Fox and the Hound or Harold and Maude or E.T. and the examples go on and on. And this seemed like an opportunity to be able to do just that, to maybe add to that rich history of that theme. So I definitely wanted time to fully deal with a goodbye and to give it the space that it needed, as well as sort of reflecting my love of Born Free to be able to have one last visit, which we accomplished. And it has this, it's this nice emotional roller coaster, whatever you might think of the story. Once you're in that moment, I feel like we have everybody and they're being moved to tears and coups of relief and laughter in the, in the coda of the film. And I feel very proud of that. And that was pure from the intention from the moment we decided to do a trilogy. At one point, yeah. did you know that that would be the ending? It was shortly after the release of the first movie. And Chris Sanders and I were just trying to get a movie that worked for the first one. We had a very little time, as right, you know. Right. So it was a rush to the finish. In the wake of its success, Jeffrey Katzenberg said, I want you to start thinking about a sequel. And due to my general allergy to sequels, if they lack purpose, if they don't feel like they're advancing the story, I pitched back the idea of let's do a trilogy, three acts of one story that will track Hiccup's coming of age from nuisance Viking run to the tribe to wise selfless chief, but in the process, say goodbye to dragons in some way. What happened? You know, how did the world get returned to the one that we know? Which goes back to the first line in the book. It does, yeah. That, and that's a key part of it. Cressida Cowell came to visit the studio, and she was working on the last of her How to Train Your Dragon books, I think the 12th in the series. And she said, I'm going to explain what happened to dragons and why they aren't here anymore. And I thought, oh, that's really, that's such a compelling, emotional, mysterious goal. And... Anyone who knows the books and the films, they'll know that the books are quite different from the films. And that was a creative decision that was made early on. But as an end goal, that felt very compelling to me. And it did tie into that opening line. I do remember that feeling kind of an emotional pang when I opened up the book and read that first line. Hiccup as an old man reflecting back on his youth. And the opening line was, there were dragons when I was a boy. So, like, ooh, you know, there's, there's a great mystery here. Where did they go? So you knew the ending, but tell us about the writing process for this third film. Did you go in a lot of different directions? Yes. I think if I were to sum it up, I spent the first few drafts being a little too loyal to the second film, to the continuity of that story until and we were well on our way. We had storyboarded almost the entire movie when Jeffrey Katzenberg pulled me aside and he said, this feels a little too much like Dragon 2 Part 2. And I feel that in our climate, we have to offer moviegoers a lot of new, new elements in order for them to be attracted to the film, which I think was a great note, and I wished I'd had it earlier. But inspired by that, I booked myself a room up at Skywalker Ranch and just hold myself in for a month and completely rewrote it from scratch, injecting as many sort of fanboy ideas of my own into it to make it feel connected to but not reliant upon the two films that came before it. And that was really difficult, but a lot of fun in the end. And I'm, I'm glad that I had that opportunity to inject new life into it. That was the draft that got everyone excited, and we started moving forward. What was in that draft that wasn't in the previous one? 
I played up more of the romance between Toothless and the Light Fury. Grimmel was a different character. In the original version, Grimmel was kind of a sniveling, scheming character who had wanted to take over from Drago while Drago was still in power. And the moment he was gone, he took that position. So Grimmel got reinvented as kind of a lone wolf with his own hunting pack. And those dragons were completely reinvented in that scenario as well. Just that element for sure. And then I think the quest idea, the pursuit of the hidden world, was a new idea as well. In previous versions, he had already mapped out as kind of a B plan this island, which becomes known as New Burke in the movie. And he had even started construction on it for the day when he knew they would have to leave. So I think going for broke on a quest for something that may or may not be there, that's based on some old sailor's myth, that felt like a nice element, kind of a big idea. And there's desperation in it, and there's plenty of room for self-doubt. So I embraced that as well. I think those were the big elements that we brought to the mix. Did you have a favorite scene in this film? Well, in this film, again, it sort of touches into spoilers. I don't know how much we're going to be concerned about that here, but I love the ending. I love the goodbye. That for me is the culmination of the ambition of this whole trilogy. If we could get characters to fall in love with this duo, so much so that having them say goodbye for all the right reasons will still tear you apart, that that for me is success. It was unexpected and it was so satisfying and so beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. How does it feel to step away after finishing this film? You've been living with these characters for 12 years now. It's a combination. It's certainly bittersweet. It's a combination of pride because I do feel like we accomplished our goal and we sent this movie off into the world with the kind of purpose and the integrity that we planned for it. And yet at the same time, it is not only saying goodbye to the characters and this world that we've woven together, but we're saying goodbye to one another. We don't know if this same team will be reassembled for another project. And people do go their separate ways. And even at a studio of this size, teams get assigned to different projects. And so, so it really felt like we were this uh, tight-knit group that had a strong belief in what we were doing. And you know, saying goodbye to those folks, it's like finishing high school or, or, or elementary school. So you don't know if you're going to see your friends again, even if they might be in the same school, it's just classes get divided. So I think that's maybe the greatest pang that I feel is I really love coming to work and working with these amazing artists and passionate technicians and production staff. And I feel that loss more than a loss of the characters. I'm too close to it right now to really miss right. Hiccup and the gang and their world. Right, right. Also, while you were working on the film, there was an acquisition. Jeffrey Katzenberg moved on. There were a lot of changes at the studio. How did all of that impact the making of this movie? When that news was announced, I was still up at Skywalker Ranch in the middle of my rewrite. <laughs> so I really oh. didn't know what that meant. I didn't know if it was going to derail this idea of a trilogy as a concept. I didn't know if Universal was going to want a whole slew of sequels. So that made me nervous. But I just decided to keep my head down and keep working with the team on this movie that we believed in. And as things sort of settled, and you know, there was always time in an acquisition where it seems there was no movement, we just sort of kept movement within our own little team. And I was delighted when I finally sat down with Donna Langley. We began speaking about the project, and I referenced as one of my inspirations, Born Free. And she loved that movie growing up. And so she, it felt like she was completely on board from the beginning, just the spirit of it, the emotion, and kind of the enlightened transformation of a human character to realize that this animal that they think they're protecting and they have such a tight bond with does belong, you know, need, needs to fulfill its own destiny in the wild. And she really loved all of that. So I felt we were in good hands from the moment the, the transition actually completed. When did you know you wanted to get into animation? So I grew up wanting to be a comic book artist. And I learned to draw from comic books. I learned to tell stories from comic books and the few films that I got to see because I grew up kind of poor. So I didn't quite know how to connect to that ambition with the reality of working for Marvel or DC. It seemed like a wild disconnect. It, you know, my little life in Elmer, Quebec and some giant studio in New York City, I didn't know the path toward it. But when I did look around as I finished up 
high school, I discovered a classical animation program being taught at Sheridan College, just outside of Toronto. And they offered a summer school, which is primarily for international students. But I got in anyway. They must have had a slot open. And it's the year curriculum crushed into three months. So lots of long hours, lots of camaraderie. But I immediately realized that everything I loved about comic books was in this world of animation. It was, I could create worlds, I could design characters, I could breathe life into them, I could be the architect of the story, and yet it's all brought to life. And it reaches audiences around the world. And so I became kind of seduced by it and loved it and threw myself into it. I did three years of that. And during the rest of the year, I worked at a small animation studio in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, that made a, a popular Canadian TV series and their first feature film, which I also had a chance to work on. So I was cutting my teeth and learning what it was to be a professional animator while still attending college. And after that, I was hired out of school to go work for Don Bluth in Ireland. It was four years of working in Ireland before I was accepted to the Walt Disney Studios to begin working on Mulan, and after that, Lilo and Stitch. But at no point did I think in my upbringing that Hollywood was a possibility, that being able to make movies was a possibility. It just was outside of my reality. <laughs> and what I've learned since then is just you set your mind on the goal and those opportunities start presenting themselves to you, that it's not as far away as you think it is. Do you know what you'll be working on next, or you're taking a long break? <laughs> <laughs> I am going to take a little break, just to clear my head, but... I have already started having meetings and everything's wide open. It's a strange and wonderful feeling to have no idea what you're doing with your future. Thank you so much for joining us today and congratulations on the film. Thank you very much. I'm really, really happy to you know sit down and talk with you. And thanks for being such a great support throughout all three movies. Thanks for tuning in to Behind the Screen. We'll be back with new episodes starting the week of March 18th. Please be sure to like and subscribe to the podcast series. And during the break, you can check out all the latest news at THR.com.